All right, we are in Esther chapter 7. Esther chapter 7. So Esther chapter 7 starts out this way. It says, so the king and Haman went into feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. And King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the palace where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left his mouth, as the word left the mouth of the king, um, they covered Haman's face. Then Habona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman was prepared has prepared for Mordecai whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the wrath of the king abated. All right. So in what situations is it difficult for you to stand up for what you believe in. In what situation is it difficult for you to stand up for what you truly believe in? When everybody else around you is in opposition to you, they oppose you. Yeah. Anything else? That's, that's definitely difficult. It's very hard to stand up for what you know is right and what you know is true when everybody around you holds a different opinion, holds a different view, even if they're not hostile. And listen, sometimes people are hostile, right? Sometimes people are angry. Um, think about politics. Um, if you're of one political persuasion and everybody else around you is of the opposite political persuasion, it'd be very difficult for you to even mention that you're of a different, you know, especially today. You know, years ago, you could be, uh, a Democrat or a Republican or whatever the other options are, which independent, independent all the, you could be whatever and you could let people know and you could still have a conversation. You could still be friendly and all that. Less and less of that today, more and more animosity. So it can be very difficult to stand up even then and just, just mention that you're a different view, even if, you, you know, even if you're not trying to persuade them of something. Um, how much harder when it's something you know is certainly true? Let's talk maybe r religiously or something. You know, you're in a crowd of people and they are atheists or a completely different religious persuasion, and you know, you're in that situation. It'd be very difficult. So, in those kind of situations, when we're surrounded by people 
who disagree with us, it can be hard for us to stand up to those um, in those situations. What about what about when people are hostile, not just of a different view, but maybe would kill you? Would that be difficult to stand up for what you know is true? If you knew the people around you might very well kill you. That was a good possibility. That's, that's probably difficult, difficult thing. Um, so what did the king offer Queen Esther at the banquet that she had prepared for him? Verses one and two, what, what was it that he offered her? Half the kingdom. Half the kingdom, what does that mean? Anything she wanted. Anything she wants, probably not literally <laughs> half the kingdom, right? Probably yeah. not, because we know that this, this is used elsewhere in the Bible. It's also used in history. It was more than likely a way of saying, I promise I will give you whatever you ask. And then the hyperbole, it's hyperbole. There's no way King Xerxes is thinking, I'm going to give you half of my kingdom for real. It's, a, it, it's more than likely just a way of saying, I promise I'll give you what you want. Now, if she would have said, I want half your kingdom, he probably would have said, well, uh, there's another wife who's going to be thrown, you know, in the cellar for a while, you know. Unlikely that that's what's going on. But he's promising, whatever you ask me, I'll give to you. She's probably not asking for the kingdom anyways. So what did she ask for? What did Queen Esther ask for in verses three and four? Her life. Yeah, her life. And who else's life? Her people. Her people. She asked for her life and the life of her people. How did the king react to Esther's request? Uh, who did that? <laughs> yeah, because this is a shock to the king, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this would be surprising. Right? If you're the king, your wife is the queen, who's in control of life and death? The Just king. in a worldly sense, right? The king is, yeah. right? You're in my kingdom. This is my rule. This is my reign. So when Queen Esther says, my life and the life of my people are going to be destroyed, that should be, that's a shock to king, to the king, isn't it? What are you, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you talking about? And then, of course, the question is, the question's who, right? Who did this? Tell me about it. What's going on? Give me a little bit more information, right? Who wants to know? So who was revealed to be the person behind the plot to kill her and her people? Haman. Haman. Okay. Did Haman know that Esther was a Jew? I don't think so. Yeah, unlikely. <laughs> if he had known that she was a Jew, do you think he would have plotted to kill all the Jewish people? You think yes? Yes. Yeah. If he had known that the queen was a Jew, do you think he would have tried to have all the Jews killed? Probably not, but he would have still been after Mordecai. He would have been angry with Mordecai's death, but unlikely that he would have put the queen in that category as well, right? It's one thing to kill to plot to kill one of the king's, you know, kind of buddies that does some kind of work, right? He's in the employ of the king. It's quite another to try to plot to kill his wife, right? I mean, let's be honest. If Haman knew that she was Jewish, Haman would have tried to do something else to get to Mordecai, but not this, right? He wouldn't have just said, I want to have all the Jews killed. Wouldn't have worked. Wouldn't work. I don't think Haman's that stupid. Right? He would have recognized something, something different uh, is going on here. I'm not going to do that. Um, 
So what did the king do when uh, he discovered the truth about Haman? What did the king do? I got to think. He said, I got to think. <laughs> what am I? Yeah, he leaves his wine drinking, right? He's got this, there's a party going on. Everything's happy-go-lucky. And then this is a bombshell that's dropped on him. This is shocking. Somebody's trying to kill my wife and, and all the people. And it's the, the dude that I, it's right here. It's this guy. It's this guy who's supposed to be, you know, I don't know if he was second in command, but pretty close to that. He was pretty high up, pretty special. I remember Haman thinks he's so special. The king is going to honor him. Remember the last chapter? He was like, the king comes to him and says, hey, I want to honor somebody special. Haman thinks. He must be talking about me. I'm the best guy, right? So probably close to his number two, maybe his number two. And then the king realizes, finds out, discovers, this guy's plotting to kill my wife. So he gets up, needs some air, right? I don't know if you've ever been there. You ever get some disturbing news? You need to go take a walk. You go outside, going to get some fresh air. That's what he's doing. He's he, he, this is a bombshell, right? You can imagine what's going on. He needs to take a break. So he goes outside to his garden. Then what happens? He comes in. It just so happens Haman's still there. On the couch, baby. <laughs> now he's on the couch. <laughs> Looks like he's oh. Well, that's exactly what it is, right? The text says he's just begging for his life. And he's, you can imagine being so distraught. I could imagine being there like, uh-oh, this is bad. Let me beg for my life. And you can imagine like falling on the couch and saying, please, you know, whatever. But the, but the king comes in and sees him on the couch with his wife, who he just found out is trying to kill her. And, and then so he's, now he's really enraged, right? Could you imagine being King Ahasuerus? Can you imagine being that guy coming in? Now, he's probably not in his right mind fully, right? Because what's been going on the whole day? They've been drinking. They've been drinking. So he's probably, you, you remember what happened. I think about what kind of guy King Ahasuerus is. The beginning of the book of Esther starts with a big party, big drinking party for a long time. And then the queen at that time, a different queen, will not come. He's been drinking a while. She won't come. He gets angry, sends her off, banishes her. You're never going to come back again. right? After he sobers up, he's like, I kind of miss her. <laughs> you know. So in the midst of his uh, intoxication, he tends to be a man who flies off the handle. He comes in, he sees this happening. He's going to fly off the handle. This is just the character of who this guy is. He's already been a little, you know, he's, I'm sure he's not realizing this guy's just begging for his life. He sees this. He's not thinking clearly. He's got some information here that's disturbing him. So now he is going to really get angry and uh, he is going to do what to Haman? Get him. Absolutely. He's going to, he's going to kill him. Did anybody notice that this kind of seems like this whole, this whole scene at the end here kind of reminds me of like a mob movie. What do they do to his face? This reminds me of like some kind of abduction movie. When I read this, I think this is like a mob movie. This is an abduction movie or something like that, right? They put a bag over this guy's face. They're taking him away. This is not good. He's going out. So he's got this bag over his head. Take him out. And what, what happens to be the discussion that one of the eunuchs brings up? There happens to be a gallows. <laughs> yep, there's a gallows. I guess some of the king's men, like to know, or some of them, mm -hmm. yeah, they know about it. They know about the gallows. 
And they know that it was for Mordecai because it's brought up. Hey, the guy that you honored that saved your life, this guy who's trying to kill your wife and, and him and the whole family and all of that kind of stuff. This guy, he built a gallows. And um, what do you what do you think? And the king says, what's he say? Hang him. <laughs> Hang him on those gallows. That's kind of ironic. I'm going to build this for Mordecai, and then this guy is the one hanging on it, right? He's killed. <laughs> He's having a real bad day. So how do you see God's hand at work in the event of this story? Just think about, just think about this chapter. We could think about the whole book, but just think about this chapter for a moment. How can you see God's hand in the midst of this just in this chapter. Well, he's delivering his people. He's delivering his people. That's true. Yes. Yep. And her request is such that it exposes Haman for who he is and what he's up to. Um, because of God's problems, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's right, Haman's own doing. Uh, this is what happens, but God is in the midst of all of this. Just you know, it's one of those things. Just so happens to be that one of the eunuchs knows what's going on and decides at this moment to tell him what's going on. It just so happened that Haman had planned to hang the guy who actually saved the king early on. That the king has, now we can think about the full story unfolding, right? I mean, it just so happened. It just so happened. Right? Coincidence after coincidence after well, it's not coincidence, right? But there's something being woven through this whole thing that these series of events are just working their way through. And yet in the midst of all this, the people are free to do what they want to do, right? God didn't make Haman do this, did he? No, why would he, why would he make Haman want to kill his? No, he doesn't do that. But he's working in the midst of all of this. So we read that passage that says God works everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Is that here? Yes. Sure. Did it look like that at the beginning? No. It looked bad, right? And yet at the end of it, hindsight, you're able to look back and say, ah, God was working in the midst of it, even through the fear. Was Esther ever afraid? Yes. yes. Sure she was, right? She was she was really afraid. She's like, I can't go into the king. If I go in there, he he might not give me the scepter. I could be killed. I could be banished. So she had moments of fear as well. Did it look bad for the Jewish people? Did they even know what was going on? Did every Jewish person know what was going on in the king's palace? No. No. no they are not all knowing, right? They didn't know everything was going on. So think if you were the average Jewish person who had heard about this decree that you're going to be slaughtered, what would you be thinking? Where's God? <laughs> right? I might be thinking, uh, where are you? Especially, especially think about this. You've done nothing wrong. Let's say you're a Jewish person living your life, taking care of your family, working a hard day's work, praising God, honoring him the best you can. And then all of a sudden you're like, what? We're going to be slaughtered on this day? What have I done to deserve this? I could think that. And not knowing what is going on in the midst of the palace and all of that. So there, this story teaches us some things about the providence of God, doesn't it? 
We don't always know how it's going to work out. We don't always know, but God is in the midst of all of it. Even in our fear, even when we don't know how is this going to impact me, even when we think and we know I actually haven't done anything wrong. So we got to remove the concept that if bad things happen to us, that God is doing it to us. Bad things happen in the world. But God is working through all of that for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So think big picture about this. Because not everybody who is a Jewish person knows that Queen Esther is going in to see the king and that there's some hope, a glimmer of hope. They don't know that. The vast majority probably have no clue. They didn't have email, text messages, Facebook, and all. They didn't have that kind of communication. They wouldn't have known all the details. So, so when this was happening, there was chaos. The thing had already been delivered. There was chaos having problems. It wasn't there. Yeah, it had been signed, remember? And he sends it out. Yeah, it was already a decree that this was going to happen. Yeah, because if it hadn't been signed into law, it wouldn't have been a big deal. The king could have just said, no, no big deal. We won't do that. <laughs> but he had signed it into law and sent it out. And it was going to take a while. It was going to take a while before this day came. But the day was set. They were going to be slaughtered um, on that day. Okay. How does this story parallel the story of humanity? Think about it for a moment. How does this story parallel the story of the human family? Oh, things don't always look good. That's true. But usually they have a way of working out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, things don't always work out the way we want. That is true. That is true. Anybody else? Yeah, you can think, why, why me? What did I do to deserve this? How come? What? And then you look at your life and you think, I'm trying. I, I'm like, there's nothing. There's no, you know, open public wicked. I'm not, I'm not, you know, a drug dealer going. I'm not doing crazy things, right? That you would think. In about three Why minutes. me? Don't mean to you all, but we all have a past. No. Okay. Uh, she said that the the signal was okay out here. Yes, sir. It is. I think you got a good signal, Luther. Oh. That's all right. I'm gonna mute you, brother. <laughs> um. Everybody else is like, what? I thought he had something amazing to say. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's in there. It's not a strong signal. I don't know what that means. Um, wh what about the concept that satanic forces, um, and of course our own sins have been hard at work to destroy us. Think back Genesis. Think back Satan. Think back the enemy. Think back how the human family, and again, our own sins are involved in this, but think back of wanting to wipe out the human family, wanting sin to so destroy and, and all of that kind of stuff. Satan wants to destroy from Genesis onward. He wanted to have the, the human family destroyed. So there's a Haman kind of concept going on there where just the whole human family is under the death penalty. Is that true? Yeah. All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. So the whole human family is under the death penalty, which is what Haman had the king sign was this death penalty for the whole Jewish family. And then, of course, you have God working in the midst of all this, but you have God weaving in human history a plan of redemption that we don't always see, that we don't always understand, but we see woven through history god is working out a plan of redemption so that 
his people, those who would embrace him by faith and all that, would find salvation. So there's a bit of an overlay of that story on the human family, at least big picture kind of concept. We were all under the sentence of death, and yet there was one who comes in and rescues us, takes our place. You could kind of look at Esther, even though she doesn't take away the sins of the people, she doesn't rescue the people kind of in and of herself. She does go before the king. She does plead for her people, um, right? You see, yeah, she's a Christ figure, isn't she? She pleads for her people, right? Jesus pleads on behalf of the human family, right? And so those who would embrace him be part of that family are finding salvation. So again, it's not a perfect one-for-one -one correspondence, but typology is not typically one-for-one -one correspondence anyways. Big picture themes you're looking at here. There's a figure who comes and pleads for those who are under the death penalty, and there's, and we'll see, there's salvation that comes. Now, Haman is hung on a kind of, he's, he's hung on the gallows, right? He's destroyed. So we could look at that as what happens with Satan when Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. Interesting that Jesus is the one who's crucified, but it's in that moment, it's on the cross, that the death blow is given to Satan and to sin and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a big picture going on there. We also see, um, well, let me ask this. Um, think about these texts too, because the book of Esther shows us that the plan, the plan is working out according to God's timing. Wouldn't you say? God's got perfect timing. It's like just at the right time, Haman goes into the king when he can't sleep. At the right time, Esther makes her request. At the right time, Haman is there at the right time, right? There's this right time planning. So think about these scriptures here. Oh, that does not show up fully, does it? Well, I'm going to read that to you because it's kind of half broken off. Why? I don't know. But Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, Titus 1, 1 through 3 says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faithful, uh, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of our God and um, of God, our Savior. So you see that timing issue. And in Galatians 4, 4 and 5 say, but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons so these are just to show that god has been weaving throughout history this plan of redemption this plan of salvation and christ comes on the scene at the perfect time the right time the proper time just like we find in the book of esther we see these Wow, it just so happens this is the right time, the right time, the right time. God is in the midst of all of this. He's working it out uh, for the good of his people and those who love him. So what does this story reveal to us about the consequences of sin and or unrepentant sin? Because Haman is unrepentant in his sin uh, of wanting to murder people. It leads to death. So we could say there are consequences. Is that true? When, when sin, when we sin, when someone sins, there's always consequences. Always isn't, consequences. Go ahead. Isn't, there, isn't there a verse that says your sins will find you out? Yeah, yes, absolutely. That's right. Your sins will find you out. You can't hide them. Um, think about King David as well. 
Remember King David tries to hide. We, we think of that big, big event in his life where he um, commits adultery with Bathsheba. He kills her husband, Uriah. He murders the guy and he's trying to hide it. And yet, very interesting, his sins find him out. He can't hide from it. They find him out. So uh, it reveals to us that there are always consequences and they're severe. Usually they're severe. Um, and as Tim said, it leads to death. And we know that too. Scripture will talk about the wages of sin is death. death. Yeah. So it's severe, which should be a warning to us. <laughs> well, sin always brings about consequences. Correct. Now, unto death would be, depending on what kind of death you're talking about, unto death spiritually would be removed in Jesus. So the sin wouldn't be unto spiritual death any longer, separation from God. But your sin could still lead to death. And in fact, the reality is the human family is still under physical death sentence. The consequences of sin, because it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, not that we inherit their sin, but we inherit the consequence of their sin. No longer able to eat of the tree of life and live forever. We now need the, the one who is the tree of life, Jesus, right? And we will get resurrection and all that later. But we die, innocent babies die, not because they inherit the sin of Adam, but because we inherit the consequence. We no longer have access to that tree that would let them live forever. Um, and so we do f die physically. So we will, we will often have to deal with the consequences of sin. God doesn't take away the consequence of sin, although we can be forgiven of it. Um, somebody like David commits sin. He has a child. That child dies. There's the consequence of sin. His sins can be forgiven, but there's consequences that happen. Yeah. Um, so, the consequences are usually always there. And again, depending on what the sin is, we might be able to nuance that a little bit. But God doesn't wipe away the consequences, but he will forgive. And so I, I'm reminded of, has anybody seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, the movie? Okay. Yes. I'm reminded, yes, if you've seen it, I'm reminded of when the, um, the two guys, they're criminals, they've escaped from prison or whatever, they're on the run. They're baptized. In the river, they come out, they're like, the preacher said, our sins are clean, we're good, you know. And they were thinking, they're free, they're, they're no longer lawbreakers, right? That, that the law, is, and um, is it George Clooney, his character said something to say, I don't think that's the way it works, you know. The, the lawman's still going to come and get you kind of thing. Like, you're okay with the Lord, you're just not okay with Johnny Law. So, there's always those consequences, but that's what that kind of reminds me of. There's still consequences, although we can find forgiveness. Um, but sin, especially unrepentant sin, there's severe consequences that will find us out. Um, it's important to think about. Um, now, was Esther brave and did she stand up for what was right? Anybody disagree with Jim? Jim says, yes, she was brave. She was brave. She was brave, but she was scared to death. Yeah, bravery and courage does not mean that there is elimination of fear, right? It's because things might be fearful that somebody is called courageous and brave. It's not the person who thinks, well, this doesn't bother me. Like most people aren't, you know, robots that just can go not fearing anything and go into these, these things. No, courage, bravery in the face of fear yeah so she definitely was brave she stood up for what was right even though she was afraid she did what was right so here's our homework our take-home question what situations do you need to stand up more firmly for what's right in what situations do you need to stand up more firmly for what's right 